My name is David, and this is The Big Shut-In. It's Monday, February 15th, 2021, day 337 since the shut-in began. And today, for those of you of the Catholic persuasion, is what you might call Lundi Gras, meaning the second to last day of the season of Carnival, the day before the day before Lent, meaning that tomorrow is, of course, Mardi Gras, the biggest party in a lot of places in the world, most especially in the United States, in the city of New Orleans, one of my favorite places, I think one of the most deeply interesting, specific, unique, magical places on this particular continent. And of course, Mardi Gras, like everything else this year, is not going to be the same as it normally is. Many in the city try to ignore the beast known as Rona uh, for last year's Mardi Gras celebrations, and the consequences were pretty dire. Largely because of that, the, the, the parties, the celebrations, the drinking, the dancing, the parades, and all of those bodies pressed together Louisiana generally, and, and New Orleans specifically, had just an astronomical and, and horrible death rate last late spring and summer. And so what is Mardi Gras going to look like this year? What are they going to do tomorrow in that wonderful city? Nothing? Ignore it? That doesn't seem possible. Well, I was curious. I wanted to hear more about what life in New Orleans has been like since that last disastrous spring. And what is going to happen tomorrow? What are the plans? What are the ideas? And so I was very glad to have an opportunity to speak to Andrew Ward, PhD, who, as you will hear, is a man of great energy and boundless enthusiasm for his adopted hometown, and someone who had quite a lot to say about what is going on in New Orleans right now, what has been going on, what will be going on, and how that uniqueness and wonderfulness of that city is leading maybe not to just solutions for it, but maybe to emotional, spiritual solutions for everybody. Who knows? Anyway, it was an amazing conversation, one I'm very glad to have had. And I'm very happy to introduce you to Andrew. How are you doing? I'm doing great, David. I mean, I got to tell you, this is the Big Easy Crescent City that care forgot beneath the sea. And I don't know how I would be anywhere else on God's green earth. How are things? So I'm curious to know what's different tonight than, say, this same night two years ago. Oh, man. Well, you don't have to go two years back. All you have to do is go back to last year on Lundi Gras. You know, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that Carnival is not just Mardi Gras. It's not just Fat Tuesday. You know, it's 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 uh, over two months of nonstop celebration, hundreds of parades, not just one day, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of revelers who are members of many, many, many different crews, K-R-E-W-E-S. And it built and built and built. And, you know, the one prevailing sentiment of people living in New Orleans is, you know, uh, to hell with tomorrow. There is today. Après moi, le déluge. And the... No, le 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 bon temps 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 and so we get to Carnival Day and it was an, a, its usual explosion of love and fanatical exuberance and costumes and joy. And there were many, many, many people who dressed in costumes sort of mocking the coronavirus. And, you know, the sort of dark joke about it since then is like, well, that costume didn't age well. I hope you've managed no. to scrub the internet of all the photos, you know, that were taken of you at that point. But it was really in the immediate aftermath that the severity of the situation started to kick in. And, you know, even, even on Ash Wednesday, New Orleanians are still saying, well, what's the next celebration? What's the next party? And it's going to be French Quarter Fest. And it's going to be St. Patrick's Day. All those got canceled. And that was really the first day that New Orleans woke up and said when our mayor, Latoya Cantrell, canceled St. Patrick's Day festivities. That's when everyone kind of took a step back and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So 
the your initial question that I'm giving you an extended answer to was what was it like a year ago? It was its usual magnificent magical buildup to a explosive climax of celebration, which then sort of yielded a global hangover. And then to pick up the ashes and say, wait a minute, we we've been doing other things, and now suddenly you know, the, the the dark horse and the dark rider are entering our parade and they weren't invited. You know, uh, how many people already had it and were transmitting it and what are the effects of it as a result? So, you know, when the first, I mean, here, I know, it's, it's, it's ironic that, that the time frame you're talking about because sort of February, March is when things first started getting scary here. You know, January, we were all sort of laughing about it too, you know, that this is just, it's, you know, it's a joke. It's whatever, four people in Italy, who cares? And then it, it, there was that sort of six week ramp up or something, five week, when everyone was, oh my God, like this is, this is a thing here. And w- was there any sort of sense of impending perhaps? Doom? Yeah. <laughs> like up coming up to Mardi Gras last year? Was uh, it, were there any be- naysayers or was it really just universal? Ah, whatever. We'll party through. It'll be great. Uh, it was overwhelmingly. I mean, we we have a, a a general mentality here in the you know the city of the care for God, which is you know we don't fear hurricanes, we drink them. And you know, huh. is there a, a pandemic? Yeah, we've been through a few. We're equipped to deal with hardship, tragedy, fear. Everybody kind of woke up a little blearily and said, "Well, this might be different." Well, and I, I mean, I remember that. New Orleans was one of the first around March last year, April was one of the first places in the country where things got really serious really quickly. And I'm assuming that was a direct result of that carefree Mardi Gras. What was that time like that sort of that hard Lent, let's say, picking up the ashes is ironic, you know, you know, starting on yeah, Ash Wednesday. Uh, well, there, okay. So New Orleans has all these different overlapping Venn diagrams of community. And what we saw was, you know, Tulane takes swift. I'm an adjunct professor of political science at Tulane University. And Tulane took swift and decisive action and said, mid-March, everyone's going home. And we're, we're switching to virtual right away. And, you know, at that time, there were still plenty of people who were saying, this isn't really a big deal. I don't understand why this is happening. And, you know, so there was there was some pushback, but it was pushback that was basically naysaying for want of true knowledge. People didn't understand the severity. Nobody had lost anybody yet. And so all the resistance came as a result of people thinking, won't happen to us, won't be a big deal here. And as it became a big deal here, and as, you know, the students went back and as the tourism industry crumbled and as restaurants were closed, you know, there was some, there was some real anger. We had a lot of people, especially in the service industry and the restaurant industry calling our mayor, you know, Latoya Cantrell, Latoya the Destroyer. And they were saying, you know, you're, you're ruining our, the lifeblood. How could you not have spring in New Orleans be bustling? Jazz Fest was canceled. French Quarter Fest, all the rest, you know, by not having those hundreds of millions of dollars pouring into our city where one out of five people with a job in the city work in the tourism industry, you know, 90,000 people, you were gutting our ability to support ourselves. And so, you know, there was anger, there was confusion, and that lasted for a strange, heady period of a couple months into the summer, which is normally a dead period in New Orleans anyway. The, the, The situation then is that people said, Okay, look, this is going on for a while. Just like anything else, we have to deal with it. And and then they picked up the pieces and started doing some really creative stuff. I mean, I remember things being um the reports from there being really shocking in terms of the mm-hmm. the just the 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 death rate and the the, mm-hmm. the infection rate being really really bad. Uh, t- talk to me about that period of sort of the the cold glass of water that this is this is this is something. New Orleans is one of those strange sort of islands within islands. And I came here to look at how much New Orleans, uh, you know, had more in common with Haiti than New York City, for example. We're at the top of all the worst lists. In fact, the state motto of Louisiana should be, thank God for Mississippi, because they're really dead last (laughs) all the time. And so we have this situation where we have every underlying condition imaginable, and we know it. 
You know, we're the big easy for God's sake, you know, and we were deep fried and double wide. And when something like this comes and it, and it comes after our African-American citizens, it comes after specifically, you know, our older citizens, it comes after the people with type two diabetes and obesity and heart disease. The cold glass of water kind of came as soon as we realized who this plague was coming after and the severity of the situation of everybody suddenly knows somebody who has it and everybody is trying to shield those people that they love, that they care about and not being able to. So it was really April, May, June, the first funerals came around of people, certainly in my circle. It closed in Mask of the Red Death style. The idea that this was something that couldn't be shut out with all the reveling and merrymaking in the world. This wasn't something that was geographically limited and that it was going for our culture bearers and it was going for the people that make New Orleans what it is. So we needed to circle the wagons and do everything we could in order to preserve them. Tell me about your own life and how it was affected. Because I mean, I what little I, I know about you, you, you're, you work in education and you work in tourism. Yeah. Right. And so what did you do <laughs> during all of this what did you what 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 became what became of you in <laughs> in the pl- what 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 were the entries in your plague diary here i have kept a journal every day of my life since i was 14 years old wow. i'm now 42 and, let the record yeah. show i did not know that when i <laughs> made that uh wow okay well there you go as the samuel peeps of lake Pontchartrain. Uh, what do you <laughs> tell me about? But the, same question though. Tell tell me about the changes your life was forced to take and what what your experience has been in all this. Yeah. Okay. So I, as a as a geographical um, as a social nomad over the course of my life, I'm the son of you know of, of, of diplomats, and so I grew up moving every three to four years, different language, different culture, different part of the world. And then I finally found the place that I loved. I found New Orleans and I was supposed to be here for one year. And then when Katrina came and the one place that I ever loved more than anything in the world now looked like it was on the razor's edge of total destruction. And, you know, the like finding your one true love and then, you know, she disappears forever. I was committed to rebuilding the city. In the aftermath of Katrina, and I think this is an important distinction. I'm not answering your question quite yet, but bear with me. Uh, in the aftermath of it. Katrina, one of the things that we had was the ability to get together. We had no electricity, we had no power, we had no roofs over our head, we had no civil services, we had no sense of security, but at least we could grab on to somebody else in the sweaty, murky, moldy mildew after the city was destroyed and, and hug them. And that sense of contact and connection was absolutely fundamental in rebuilding the city. So that wasn't something that we could participate in, in the aftermath of uh, the cold glass of water of COVID-19. So what did we do? We use the, you know, trite overused phrase of pivot. How can you connect with as many people as possible in a way that is safe for them? Luckily, we have a lot of outside things to do. So we've, you know, you've got City Park. We've also got City Park. Ours is the fourth largest municipal park uh, in America. And people would congregate there for socially distant barbecues and family reunions. You know, we had uh, in my own garden, we we built a guillotine and we, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we slaughtered a few watermelons representing COVID-19 in effigy and then, you know, uh, uh, preach, you know, to the no good, very bad, evil, horrible Grinch who tried to steal carnival. You know, we were going to move forward. We we're going to move past this. And people found ways of connecting. We had, uh, so I live right on Bayou St. John and about a quarter mile down, there's this lovely house that would have live music every night and people would paddle down in their kayaks and they could be socially distant. They could be outside and they're on the water and there'd be hundreds of people all out there listening to live music being played to them. It it was a, a sense of normalcy that was somehow even cooler than normal normalcy. And people didn't want to waste a minute because, you know, eat, drink, be merry at any moment in time. It might not be your mama anymore. It might be you. So that's what I was doing. And that's what my wife was doing. And then it was right in the middle of that. We found out we were pregnant. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. What was that like? What was, is this your first child? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, I have have three dogs, a cat and six decorative show hens, but this is my first human child. The, uh, 
I mean, I, I guess you have nothing to compare it to, but it strikes me that the experience of pregnancy, birth, in all of this must have been a thing to go through. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the, the funny thing is we have we have so many friends who uh, also managed to get pregnant right around the same time, you know? Uh, stuck in one bedroom, baby boom comes soon. That's what that's what happens. Wow, right. Well, I mean, what what else is there to do? I guess. So tell me, let's let's go back to where we started. So a bit. So tell me now, this t- today, what what is what does this carnival look like? Mm. Okay. Carnival has been canceled thirteen times in the history of New Orleans. We're no strangers to having to do this historically. It's in our DNA. The city burns down multiple times. We have hurricanes and all all kinds of things that happen. The difference about the plague where you can't actually be with other people and squeeze them and lick their armpits and do all the things that we would normally do generally means that we have to find creative other ways of of still having that carnival spirit. And the, the people of New Orleans have sort of adopted the mantra of the Mardi Gras Indians, you know, won't bow down, don't know how. And so people have gotten tremendously excited about these new forms of Mardi Gras celebration, which a lot of people are saying are going to be now permanent additions and part of the legacy and the unru- unfolding history. One of them, you know, most notably is the, the crew of house floats. So we don't have parades rolling through the streets, but literally thousands of houses in Orleans Parish and beyond, both banks and uh, the other side of Lake Pontchartrain, uh, have have dolled up their houses at enormous personal costs to look like Mardi Gras floats. And so people are running around, whether they're pushing their newborn babies in the stroller like we are, or they're driving in the you know cars in the back of their flatbed trucks and they're playing their guitars and blowing their trumpets. And they're going to look at the houses and people at the houses will throw beads and moon pies at them. And people in the trucks will throw things back at them and everybody will uh, continue the celebration even if they're not right up in each other's nose hairs. And, you know, that, that's just one example. Then there's Yardi Gras, you know, an extension of the crew of house floats. And that's everybody doing amazing things with their front yards so people can pass by. And, you know, then the other thing is people are taking a, enormous pride in their acts of service. So we have Feed the Second Line. I'm a member of the crew of Red Beans. And Devin DeWolf, the founder, you know, his wife, is a, an ER doc. And so they've been working really hard to get out of work musicians to serve food from restaurants, which are being underutilized to people working on the front line. Millions of dollars and dozens of thousands of meals have been provided in the process. And everybody likes to get dressed up while they're doing it. So the, the concept again goes back to, you know, you're going to cancel Mardi Gras. Okay, guess what? We're going to think of something new, something bigger, something better, and something that by God will stay from now until forever. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, that's amazing. I, I can't imagine everyone has been as optimistic as you are. I hope so. I hope everyone in the world is as optimistic as you are. But have you had any personal experience with people who perhaps have not been dealing with this so well or have been struggling to figure out how to how to get through this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I'm putting a, a glint on it because we have to. We acknowledge always, you know, the, the tragedy. We acknowledge the severity of the loss that all of us have gone through. What action are you taking to make it better? Are you feeding the second line? Are you dressing up and walking, you know, just to to are you doing your hair to take out the trash? Are you making a point of reaching out to those people that you know are isolated and spreading a little bit of joy? It becomes a point of pride. It's, it's one of the reasons I moved here, uh, you know, in 2004 and definitely stayed here. And it's something that is a beacon for everybody else that's looking for a little light of hope. Your question is a good one, and it's an important one. This is also the city that puts fun in funeral. You know, we with our, our, our world of, of jazz funeral celebrations, if I could bend your ear for a little bit more. Please. So, yeah, no, I got time. Awesome. Thank you. You're, you're <laughs> Normally on Mardi Gras Day, I'll wake up at about four in the morning and go down to the Bywater. And there uh, around Cluett Street, we'll meet up with the other members of the Society of St. Anne. And the Society of St. Anne is 
in over the decades, it's been referred to as the gay parade, or it's been the parade of Mardi Gras Day. It's the only parade that goes into the quarter on Fat Tuesday. And it parades all the way from the Bywater, several miles, you know, winding its way, going past various uh, bars and restaurants with the most tremendously magnificent costumes, everybody waving maypoles, and the band is the Storyville Stompers. And when they get through the quarter and everybody is delighted by the glory and the majesty that they've just beheld, take a sharp turn to go down to the river. That's when the band changes their tone. And it goes from the normal revelry to a somber march. And that's when all those people who have passed, members of the crew of the past year, have their ashes that have been born in this one last hurrah. And they've mixed their ashes oftentimes with glitter and or sequins and take it down to the river and then pour their ashes in as a final farewell. And we remember even on this high holy day of life and joy, you know, it's a funeral for many dozens of people that we lost in the previous year. And one of the reasons how this came to be is that in the height of the AIDS epidemic, a lot of cemeteries would not allow people who had passed of the disease to be buried on their sacred ground. This is part and parcel of our highest holy day of celebration is remembering death with a, with a deep-seated set of roots in disease. And so that is something that <clears throat> we're all experiencing uh, on the daily and now seeing it even more up close. 2022, there's going to be a lot more ashes going to the Mississippi. That was beautiful, by the way. Thank you for that. Um, you know, New York, where I live, and New Orleans are two of my very favorite places in the in the world, not just the country, but in the world. And they're very different places. They vibrate at very different frequencies, I think. But there's a similarity, it occurs to me, that is that they are both places that the things that make them magical and special really are about being in proximity, close proximity with other humans in a way that you aren't in a lot of American cities where you get in your car and you drive to a thing and you get out of your car and you get back, you know. And it occurs to me that I've thought often about the party that we're going to (laughs) have when everyone's vaccinated, you know. I mean the 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 I mean I'm a musician and I, I'm just thinking about what that first show that we're going to be able to play my band uh-huh. is going to be able to play is going to be religious. I mean, you know, I think the the we're all waiting for this release, and I I imagine you've thought about that too. Like what? Oh, there is going to be an explosion of activity, shall we say, in the immediate aftermath of everybody getting vaccinated. People already preparing. the the So the carnival, its great high imperial majesty is Rex. And Rex issued his proclamation today saying to his beloved subjects, be safe. And our revelries in 2022 will rival the very best things that we could imagine having done this year. Your point is well taken. And again, it reminds me of the immediate aftermath of Katrina. Uh, Our first jazz fest, you know, uh, from your part of the world over there, over in Jersey, uh, Bruce Springsteen shows up and uh, he did a a wonderful, wonderful set on the closing day. And he sang My City in Ruins, right, of course. And uh, there were, you know, 50,000 people at the Acura stage at the time and not a dry eye amongst us. I myself, you know, weeping like my own newborn. And he looks out and I'll never forget him saying, this is memorable. <laughs> and then he, then he goes off stage and, you know, nobody was ready for that to happen. They're like, no, 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 we've, we've been waiting. We, we were scared that this was lost and we'd never have it again. And they refused to let him go without an encore. And then another encore and another encore. Jazz Fest is supposed to be done at seven. And now, like, you know, the organizers are looking at their clocks and be like, Bruce, you, you got to go home. And he's like, I can't. They won't let me. And so he finally, you know, sends a, a sousaphone player out on stage and he starts doing the bass line for when the Saints go marching in. And next thing you know, all the other musicians from all the other stages who are done are all up on stage together. And it's not 50,000 people in front of the stage. It's like 200,000 people who are all packed in there. And everybody who lives around the fairgrounds are like climbing up over the fences just to have this one earth shattering moment of holy mackerel. We thought this was dead and gone forever, but it shall live on. Do you think there will be, considering the aftermath of last year's, Mardi Gras. 
do you think there will be any hesitation, reluctance for people to, you know, do you think it's going to be hard to convince people that things are back to normal? What, what will back to normal? When, when will we know things are back to normal in your That's the, that was the $64 million question, isn't it? Right. Yeah. You know, uh, is it when there's a critical mass of people who are vaccinated? Um, also who, who else is coming to New Orleans? What, what, I mean, New Orleans is a tiny little blue island in an overwhelming red sea of scariness and horror, terror, <laughs> you know, and on and on and on. I think there's going to be an avoidance of uh, certain sets of outsiders, and that's going to affect the tourism industry. I can tell you, as you meant, you you asked me earlier before, um, you know, what, what does it look like on the ground? You know, my my pedigree comes as a tour guide. And one of the things that was so striking is you you give a tour of the French Quarter and, you know, here will be this this group of people. They have to wear masks because it's the law and they can't buy their tickets unless they wear masks. But at the end of the tour, they come right up to you and they look at you and they hold that five dollar bill. They're going to tip you and they put the hand out almost as a challenge. Will you shake my hand? Hippie scum. Will you touch me? You know, you're not going to get this. I'm going to wave it around like a bone unless you actually make physical contact with me because I don't believe in any of this. Let's talk about that. I mean, about that. That's something I've talked about before in in other contexts of other parts of the country. But I mean, how are how are you handling the sort of it's something I'm wishing somebody would tell me how to handle this? How do how do you how do you convince people that dead that the dead are really dead. How do you convince people that the sick are really sick if they refuse to open their eyes and acknowledge that? I mean, what do we do as a country, do you think? As somebody who's sitting from this, as you said, blue bastion in a red sea, where you're going to be having to deal with, are dealing with that, have to deal with that. How do we do that, do you think? Uh, you're asking all the you know biggest, best, and most important questions you know, for how we proceed going forward. Because Thank honestly, you. this- <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it doesn't end here, does it, Dave? No, I mean, it, it's it's not just a pandemic. And I hate to sound like I'm belittling this particularly horrible pox on the face of our history, but the pandemic is more symptomatic, or at least the response to the pandemic has been symptomatic of a deeper plague of something far more horrible, which is distrust of science, which is distrust of knowledge, which is uh, you know a, a failure of leadership. All of those things need to be addressed. And they need to be addressed from a perspective. One of the classes I'm teaching at Tulane now is the rise of Christian nationalism in America. And one of the things that we find is that there's a level of feeling completely disaffected, feeling trodden down by you, Yankee, North, you know, you coastal elite. And the only way that they have to rebel is to say, no, I won't wear the mask rather than a meaningful participation in ongoing legal, you know, democratic process. So how do we address, you know, how people deal with the pandemic? Uh, Comrade Hoffman uh, is, is really a deeper question of how do we deal with this division in America in terms of giving voice to even those whose voice Sounds pretty horrible to most of us. Is that the answer? Is is the problem that people don't have? I mean, I've, you know, th- there was a, um, there was a, a picture the other day that I thought was a real that, that came out of Washington, and it was it, it may have been Marjorie Taylor Greene, or it was one of these sort of new kind of QAnon Tea Party uh, Congress people, and and she was wearing a a mask on the floor of the the Congress that said, you know, you will not silence me or I I cannot be silenced. And there's a person complaining that she did not have a voice while she was literally speaking into a microphone on national television. And, (laughs) you know, it strikes me that the problem is not that people, I don't know. It's not that people don't have a voice. It's Mm. not that people aren't being listened to. They've, they've, grab the microphone and they're the only people who have any had any voice at all for years now. So what is the problem if that's not the problem? Senior Hoffman, comrade Hoffman, dear beloved one, you are making the classic age old error of confusing logic and reality with perception. 
And it doesn't matter if they do have a bullhorn. It doesn't matter if they do have their own news agencies, their own universities, their own think tanks, their own policy bureaus. All that matters is that they feel that people are looking down at them. They feel as if they don't have a voice in a system that can affect change. They feel under attack at all times. And therefore, they're going to find common cause with other people who are pissed off and not going to take it anymore. I mean, the, honestly, at the end of the day, they have very little in common with each other except their anger. I mean, that's we're getting way down a rabbit hole here. But I mean, one of the more amazing things about Trumpism or whatever is that he has to me is that he has both Nazis and and Orthodox Jews. Yes. Vote, like it's incredible. It's not so incredible if we've been following the grievances that these people have been voicing for the last 40 years. We find it, it actually was an inevitable alliance. And there was there was nothing new that I heard Trump say or Steve Bannon or any of these other characters. And I don't believe this is a rabbit hole. I don't think this is off uh, kilter at all. I believe that New Orleans could be the antidote to the particular levels of horror that we're seeing on a national level. Because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Rotarian as well here, and I have members of my Rotary Club that are to the right of Attila the Hun. By and large, you know, their, their concerns are not so very much a tribe apart, and they can live peacefully and harmoniously in a town like New Orleans because they feel like they always have an outlet. You know, you, the, they have friends of other races and religions who will invite them over for dinner. But in New Orleans, we have, you know, the United Colors of Benetton. We have every color of the rainbow and we got the Creoles who don't identify as African-American, the African-Americans who say, yeah, we're not like those Creoles over there. And you've got the Catholic and the Protestant. And the first Jewish people that came to New Orleans were Sephardic Jews. Successive waves of immigrants came in and all the French and Spanish Catholics said, all right, we'll take everyone of every color, but please no Irish. And, and so, and, but they came here in droves. And now that's part of the way overused term. I know, but I'm using it, especially for a non-New Orleanian audience, the great seething bubbling gumbo that is New Orleans. Is it off track? Is it down a rabbit hole? No, it is the solution for our nation in a troubled time. Well, I hope so. I mean, I, so I was last there in, in your city in... 2019 for mm. my 10th 10th wedding anniversary hey, we mazel tov. um thank you as two years ago but uh uh and i i had a i had a moment there that i want to share with you i'm enjoying this tremendously so please uh, share. me too me too so as, as i said i'm a musician that was my original profession that's very close to my heart and I, i'm not a religious person but i had what felt to me very much almost like a religious experience. And I had it I had it in Congo Square. Mm. And I don't know it, because I I had read the history which is not I think still very well known. Um You should talk about it. Well that this was you know this was the place where it was the, the one place in the entire entirety of North America that African people were allowed to keep their drums and play them. And so that was the place that those rhythms and those ideas about music snuck in by accident, by some, I don't know, legislative error that allowed this to happen. I mean, it was clearly, it's amazing that that was allowed to happen anywhere. But everything that I, you know, have loved in music in my entire life and in American culture, everything that's great in American culture came from that spot, I think. In, in a lot of ways, right? And I think that's the underlying magic of New Orleans to me, is that that's the place, mm. that's, the, that's the root, that's the main stem of all of these beautiful things. I mean, there's no, there's no jazz without that, there's no rock and roll without that, there's no Broadway without that, there's no, none of this would happen without that. You know, things like you start studying about all, how much of sort of redneck culture comes from Africa. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You know, um, banjo. In terms of, well, sure. The banjo is in Africa. Absolutely. And the cooking and the, you know, Southern food yes. was invented by Africans. Unquestionably. Know. Can we bring people to an understanding of that? Is that the answer in the long term? Is Congo Square the answer? 
resoundingly yes, Congo Square is the answer. Because uh, uh, Rampart Street, so named because it used to be a wall with ramparts on it, was the city limit for New Orleans. And so these people, these uh, you know, enslaved individuals, were not allowed to congregate in groups of 10 or more uh, without religious or political overseeing within the city limits. So they walk six blocks over to what's now Congo Square, and that's no longer within city limits. And hundreds of them met, and they would play. Now, they've just come out of church, so they've heard all these European melodies. And they've got their drums, like you just pointed out. And now they're playing African rhythms and they're improvising. And my God, jazz is born. And then you've got all the Choctaw and the Chapatulas and the Homa native tribes coming in and they're trading with them and they're exchanging ideas. And they're, of course, they're exchanging music. Everything we love about America comes from blending of cultures that have been traditionally oppressed. And so if we take your advice Comrade Hoffman, <laughs> and we say the Congo Square is the answer, then yes, that's our way out of the pandemic. That's our way out of depression. That is our way out of divisiveness, is finding those things that we love most and understanding where they actually came from. What are your plans for tomorrow? There is, it's freezing cold here right now, okay? Like we have an ice storm, we have mayoral warnings, everybody shut everything down. It's like 20 degrees, 30 degrees outside, which, you know, I know it's nothing wow. crazy for you, but it's, you know, absolutely apocalypse for us. That's the thing. I don't know if Congo Square can help us with the polar vortex. You know, there's only so much the spirits of Congo Square can really do. Dancing keeps you warm. I, I mean, yeah, true, true. We're definitely going to drive to a few houses and take a look at some of them, take pictures in front of them, and then uh, exchange some gifts in plastic bags, homemade beads, you know, various bits of yum-yum. I'll be bringing my ukulele and, you know, I'll poke my head out of the top of the car and play You Are My Sunshine in Urdu. <laughs> ah. Everybody, you know, just to uh, share in that spirit. And and the, 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 the theme song for carnival since 1872, since the crown prince of the Russian empire came to visit is if ever I cease to love, if ever I cease to love, if ever I cease to love, let the moon turn into a great cream cheese, if ever I cease to love. So let us always keep love in our hearts. And that is what we shall do tomorrow until the end of time. <sighs> Joyeux Mardi Gras, Andrew. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. I can't wait for you to come down and visit. See it for yourself, and then uh, perhaps we can make some music together. I, it's a date. Consi <laughs> consider yourself engaged, sir. <laughs> this has been The Big Shut-In. My name is David Hoffman, and I produce and story edit the show, along with Tanya Mohammed. Post-production by Garrett Tiedemann. Publication and promotion by Kelsey Coors. It's a production of Race Car Radio, racecarradio.com. If you have a story you think would be a good fit for the show, please do reach out. The Big Shut In at racecarradio.com. <laughs>